Welcome to the Rightly Purpose Podcast. Thank you for listening to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Please like and drop a five-star rating to share this podcast with the rugby world. And please come in and visit us on our social media channels and our website to keep up with the rugby news all over the world. I'm Tala. I'm hosting this podcast today. I've got Sean and I've got Cooks. Um, as you probably have noticed, we weren't able to get a podcast out last week. We had some technical difficulties, unfortunately, with the same guest that we'd had technical difficulties of last week. So, Sean, I'm not so sure if maybe um, Thomas Kobe is the unlikely, is the unlikely one or if it were the problem. But every time we try to talk to him about France, something happens. Listen, I, I'm uh, the opposite. I think it's me. Like, I remember the last <laughs> one was been because none of my audio came through. And then I had issues halfway through this one. So I decided to sit it out and then nothing came through. So, yeah, I'm getting a little nervous. And then you know, you know that Scotland has won, and Finn Russell's in back and forth. Cooks has joined us in the podcast. Cooks, welcome back from your SA20 uh, journeys. I'm sure you're excited to actually fully concentrate on rugby for a while. To be fair, I was I was going to come on last week, but I missed Scotland all this because England. So I thought, no, not <laughs> like I was I've just just clip what I said last year about it, and um, and then and, and, and talk about that. But I, I figured, I figured, I figured I would do my boy Finn some justice. You know, I would. Uh, I would um or show up. Um, yeah, excited to focus on rugby again. Shame rugby seems like the ugly stepchild at the moment. First of FIFA World Cup, now SA twenty, and the, so it's, it's like kind of like my side piece now. So I'm, I'm focused to 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 give rugby some some proper love again. I'm su- I'm surprised, Cooks. I was actually waiting for you to do a solo pod last week. I mean, we didn't push <laughs> anything out, so I just figured you were going to do an hour an hour piece alone just on Scotland. So. Yeah, maybe next time, my man. <laughs> <laughs> After the island game, maybe. Sheesh, imagine. I, I did say to someone, I was like, oh, I, I, I seen a post about Finn this week. I was like, I'm, if, they, if they beat Wales, I will, I'll, I'll come back out of, out, of, out of retirement. And they did. And then the funny thing is, I, I, I was at a bar, so half time, I kind of like stopped watching for a bit. And then it was like, someone's like, are you not going to finish the game? I was like, my voice, wins. the job was about to be done. We're going to enjoy a beer. There's no, and it's, it's, it's putting a point on, and then the front of the they all flow, and, and someone's like, eh. someone ran to me, like, Finn is, Finn is going off again today. Like, and, and I'm happy that people know when Finn's happening, I, I'm, they, they come to me and warn me. And I'm like, it's like warning me that um, water tastes good, or oh, beer's a great drink. Like, you're worrying about, the, I'm worrying about things that are normal. <laughs> ah, there we go. Welcome back, yeah. Flip. I missed you. He is on top form. Don't worry a bit, ladies and gentlemen. But, we need to start, even though Cooks wants us to start in Myrfield, we need to start in Dublin for the match of the weekend. Ireland versus France, number one versus number two in the world. The first time that the Six Nations has had both the number one and the number two teams in the world. And Ireland won a match 32 points to 19. And in some ways, it's a maybe a flattering scoreline for Ireland uh, because France played quite well. But in other ways, France probably stopped about four or five tries from happening as well. So it was just such a bonkers game. Cooks, I'll start with you. I don't know if there's been a better 40 minutes of test rugby than the first half of the Ireland game. I think it was absolutely phenomenal. Like there's just crazy rugby happening all over. Each of the world-class players like stepped up to the plate. And there was also just a little bit of just or a, a big bit of craziness that was happening during the course of the game too. You know what? I, in, the first half, I sat there and I was like, "Yeah, these are the best two sides in the world." Like, if there was ever a doubt who the best two sides in the world are at the moment, I think that that first half of rugby sort of eradicated it. Do we all just like, like you know, when like an uh, England plays the box, so that then like that level sort of lifts? I was like, I sat there and I was actually a little bit worried. I was like, oh, I don't like I'm even more worried about the box. I'm like, we've got to play Ireland and potentially France. I'm like, I, that does make me a very, very, very nervous man. But what a great half of rugby. And I think Ireland is just, I know a lot of people saying like, oh, they might have peaked too soon, but I feel like they, they, they're getting better. And I feel like there's a lot, and they, and they still have things to improve on. I mean, I'm going to say this. Uh, I've always been a, a, like a, I was a DuPont was, was great, but I've never like obviously been as big on the hype train. But on Saturday, I sat there and I was like, this is a freak. I don't think there's a stronger like pound for pound rugby player than there is like on the planet at the moment than than Dupont. And I thought he was freakish. I mean, Johnny Sexton is still 
No one he got tired. I don't even know. No one he got concussed. I don't think he's, he's ever moved that far since he was like 21. Like, no one he could have finished <laughs> that game. But um, that first half was, that first half was crazy. Um, I, I, I get, like, it sounds cliche, but the best thing to say that, that that was the best two sides in the world in action. And you could see that the difference in class, you get round one and you look at Golden Wales, but you look at when, when England and, I mean, Ireland and France, that first off, that, that's going to be tough to top this year in terms of the quality of rugby. Sean, do you agree that we saw the best two sides play, getting at it on Saturday? Well, you can't argue against it with the, with the rugby they dished up. Um, I think the important thing, Cooks, that you mentioned that, that Ireland seemed to be getting better. And that's, that's something that I, I think a lot of people, but definitely me, didn't expect Ireland to be able to kick it up a gear the way they did. Um, they are, they're evolving as a team, which is flipping scary. Um, they're able to, to change things up. They're tactically able to do um, a lot of other things. They kept the ball in play. I know we, we chatted about it um, offline where I, I was under the impression that the French were, were keeping the ball in play. They love, they love the sort of, like running it nonstop and obviously against Ireland, you don't want them to set up any platforms. You don't want them to have a chance to reset their defensive system or anything like that. And it turned out that Ireland were probably keeping the ball alive as much as France were. So um, probably more so than France to be fair. So it was incredible. It was great to see the way that they, um, they approached the game. Uh, I thought 32, 19, I thought the game was a bit closer than that. Um, but that is probably not fair on Ireland because of the way that they approached the game and they just wore down the French and then seized the opportunity when they got it. So incredible, incredible game. And number one and number two in the world for sure, South Africa um, and New Zealand are definitely going to be putting their hands up um, late on in the year to, to claim that uh, those, those unofficial titles because I'm not sure that Ireland or France will be able to be dislodged too much before before the World Cup starts. Okay, so let's look at it from sort of team by team and then moment by moment. And I think you can probably just see how good Ireland are. Um, Sean, I'll, I'll stick with you. You just see how good Ireland are by that try that you got Keenan scored, that um, little that move that they did off the B B of B um, which is apparently or has been for quite a while a, a Joe Schmidt um, special. Uh, we've seen it with Australians last year, Scott Wiseman as well. But the way they ran it and the, the number of options that um, Hugo Keenan had to score the try as well was just ridiculous. So you've got on one side that sort of move, but on the other side, the two tries that Porter scored and that pick up and drive. And also it, it was quite evident even in the game last week against Wales. And Sean, you can just also touch on, on that as well, that Ireland has not only probably the best attacking structure in the world right now, but they probably also have the best pickup and game and like sort of like close contact game in the world at the moment, or at least close to that, because it seems like they're able to score if they go wide. They seem to be able to score with tricky moves. They seem to be able to score with pickup and drives as well now. Yeah, they have they have a lot of players and a lot of positions um, that are, are really well suited. They're fitting into all the game plan and all the, the, the things that are required. Um, there are players, many of them that are actually filling in positions and they're showing the skill sets outside of their regular stuff. And, and Bielam's a great example of sort of in the 10 channel with a dummy and, and a pass. So yeah, they, they, Ireland, Ireland have a full bag of tricks. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they put that move away. I know everyone's very much aware of it and analyzing the hell out of it, but um, the Springboks were undone a number of times by having lazy uh, sort of pillar and post and, and ruck defense. Um, that's the kind of thing that you want to train into your team that it becomes a 100% a heads up play and you want whoever's running the ball, whether it's your lucid, whether it's uh, your your massive flank, uh, your number four stroke flank, or you know whoever it may be, you want them to be able to make those decisions. And um, I think any team in the world at the moment, if they have lazy guys defending there, they're going to get done. Um, it's going to be looked at. It's going to be run in training by many many a side. Uh, we'll definitely be seeing it in in club rugby 
and in Super Rugby moving moving forward um, next month. So or sorry, later this month. But yeah, it it was great. They they really Ireland are really looking good. They um you know I said that they perhaps looked like they maybe scored a bit too many uh, points on Saturday, or should I say that the scoreline flatters them? And and again, it's it's not fair to say that, but. I thought that they were worth more points in round one against Wales. They, um, the Welsh came back in the game and defended really well. But to be fair, Wales are almost sewn up as wooden spooners. <laughs> like they really are looking that poor. Like if if you had to make make the call in terms of form, Italy are definitely not the sixth place side in the Six Nations at the moment. Even though they've they've also lost two, so it doesn't really matter. It's just the way Wales are playing at the moment. Um, but Ireland looked good. They scored 34 points. Uh, they looked super, super comfortable. There were moments in the game when when Wales were were on the brink of of gaining some momentum and maybe a foothold in the game, but the Irish defence got them. So Ireland, in terms of phase play, they're probably the best attacking team or for set piece for the first say three phases. I don't think there's anyone that 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 can that can beat them. It's after that that you need to. You need to try and rattle them and, and get on top of them. But they have the tight game. They have the wide game. They have the soft hands. They've got everything at the moment. It's just how long can they keep this going? You know, I think it's, it's, it's the, the scary thing, as Kutz, you've said, is just that they're improving. And we thought maybe they got to the top of their range with the New Zealand wins up away last year. And, you know, they did have a bit of a struggle against South Africa, but they were able to you know, proven that test that they can sort they can stand up to the bigger physical sides. And with France now, they just had a a, a masterclass of, of tactical um, skill as well. But just focus on a few of the players, and you're welcome to add in other players here as well. But I think the two form players for Ireland are Caelan Doris and Hugo Keenan. Um, I think they're probably the two leading players in the Six Nations right now. Doris was just fantastic, you know. Two tries from like just crazy offloads. He had a turnover. He was an absolute nuisance in the racks. He made 88 meters. He beat three defenders. Hugo Keenan on his side was just brilliant with his attacking, um, with his kicking game. He had 181 meters, which is ridiculous. Um, obviously, he scored the try as well. And he made also some good big defensive hits when he needed to as well. Um, there's many players you can add in, but I think those are the two that you can start with. Yeah, 100%. Tyler. I think Kalen Doris is doing his best to put an early shout for World Player of the Year. I mean, he's been incredible the first two games. And um, it's it's so hard not to love Hugo Keenan if you love rugby. I just love everything about his game. Like, like I know he had the, the 181 running meters, but it's just like there's no like weakness in his game. He just he does everything well. The, and, and like you look at his kick, that 422 he won. I mean, the right foot, left foot, he's got it all. But I think, yeah, those two are definitely the standouts. I think Doris, yeah, man, Doris is playing for some incredible rugby. But also, I mean, I'd love to throw in the game Gary Ringrose again. Like, the, the try he scored at the end, that just shows the sort of confidence he has now. I still thought he had no right to, to score from there, I think. But the confidence he has now in his game, and um, I think, yeah, he's flying at the moment, and he's, he's probably been the best player from from the start of the season until now, if you, if you consider um, provincial form as well. But for me, those three were the absolute standouts. Um, yeah, I, th- I think with Ireland, the only concern is what happens when Johnny Sexton gets injured. It's funny how a side so good, you take away one player, they're a completely different side. And I thought Ross Byrne wasn't too bad. But yeah, if you remove Johnny Sexton from that side, the last 20 minutes, they didn't look as good. So... Unless Ireland are going to play in blue when they play with Ross Berg versus the Euro Sea Goat, <laughs> I think they need to find a way to, to, sort of, to, find, to, to sort of balance the loss of Johnny Sexton whenever he goes off. But um, other than that, yeah, Ring Rose, hand, um, Keenan, and um, yeah, it's St. George among my three stars on the weekend. Yeah, I think at least yes, or Saturday was probably the first time that um, there wasn't a noticeable drop off when. Um, when uh when 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 Byrne came on because it did seem like he could still keep the the, the game going and Casey and Byrne did amazingly to close off that game. I think the one big improvement that I noticed from Ireland this weekend compared to even last week when they had that big um big lead against Wales and then sort of didn't really 
Uh, they had to defend a lot more in the second half was that their game management in this weekend was fantastic. Their kicking game just pinned France to the 22 the whole time. So I heard a stat that France was only in the 22 for 47 seconds in the game compared to Ireland being the 22 for, you know, I think over six minutes, something on those lines. And that was solely due to the, to, to the kicking game of Ireland. And, and pretty much everyone in that Ireland backline can kick and kick quite well. I mean, you've got Sexton, you've got the Stum Hall, whoever it is. You've got um, James Lowe and his nephew, Boone, Mac Hansen can kick well. Shudo Keenan, we've talked about as well. And they manage that game so well in terms of just making sure that any time that they could, they could just pin France down deep in the half and make France have to run from deep. And yes, France is amazing, but they're not going to beat a defense, you know, a defense like Ireland from deep all the time with if, 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 if they call the part. Sean? I tell you, there are two players that I think deserve a mention. One um, is because he's just given everyone the middle finger because there were a lot of haters, but Conor Murray, his first two rounds where he was called in to start and a lot of people were freaking out about it because um, they wanted Casey to start. He's more of a like for like for Gibson Park. Murray's done, blah, blah, blah. Murray in the last two weeks has been incredible um, and really showed why he's the second choice and stroke first choice scrum off in Ireland. And the other one is Stuart McCloskey. I, um, I've been super impressed with him. He is essentially coming into the Six Nations, is in, in inverted commas, Ireland's third choice 12 behind uh henshaw and arky however you whoever you see as first and seconds up to you and um mccloskey's really put his hand up he's done uh, he's made few errors he hasn't been a massive standout in many places but you can't have too many guys really doing the, all the standout work you've got to have guys doing the hard graft and and he's one of them so mccloskey i thought has been brilliant over the last two weeks and Connor murray's uh basically told everyone, listen, I haven't gone anywhere. Yeah, it's a big thing for Ireland that they won the test match with a, fin, uh, a team uh, consisting of in the, in the, at the end of, um, sorry, I'm just getting the names now, but that Ronan Kenneho, obviously he's good, but he's just come back from envy and, you know, he's been usurped by Dan Sheehan. At prop, they had Dave Kilcoyne and Tom O'Toole. Tom O'Toole looked like a beast when he's carrying the ball. Um, up in the last few minutes, that Craig Casey and Ross Byrne and, and Scrum Off and Fly Half, they started with Stuart McCroskey, who hasn't been part of the, the setup until um, recently. Finlay Beeman has looked really good in the place of Tad Cholong as well. So I think that's a big confidence boost for Ireland. And I think, yeah, there's a, there's a feeling, and I think, I don't know if you agree with me, gents, but you, you can sometimes see when a team is coming together at the right time. and there is that feeling with Ireland that this, they, they're starting to come together at the right time, that people are starting to inform and now substitutes are able to step in and play at almost the same level as the people that they're replacing. We, we've seen the story before, you know, be it the Springboks or the All Blacks in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years. Cooks? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, and also I think with Ireland, they don't, there's no team that they fear. I think that they probably wanted their best against the Springboks, but I think uh, mentally, that win for them has put them in a good spot coming to the Six Nations and now beating France as well. So I think they, the confidence they have now is they're absolutely buzzing at the moment. And to beat a French side, and I thought France were good in that, in that, in the, in that first half. So for them to have gone through that and then obviously still put on three points and and a very good defensive side with Sexton going off early. I think the confidence that Scotland, I mean, that Ireland has at the moment, I don't think they don't they don't fear the prospect of having to beat the Springboks. Scotland and either France or New Zealand because they've beaten all those three sides in, in, in their last times they've played. So now they've got confidence against those three sides and they, feel, and they will definitely feel like they have what it takes to get through that pool and the quarters and make it the, into that semi-final. Let's go to the other side of it and with France. Sean, I'll start with you. And France have had a very, um, not, they haven't had the best two weeks. Um, they probably won a game against a team that some ways they could have easily have lost um, and were able to sneak through, but they, they won at the end. That, yes, they had a really good first half, but in the second half, they were just totally outsmarted by Ireland and Ireland just pretty much kicked in over the gate. So, 
yeah, I'm sure what is wrong with France at the moment? Is it lack of form? Is it the game plan being found out? Is it just a, a rough patch? You know, they were winning 14 in a row. So I guess this was, you know, a loss is inevitable. Yeah, I think uh, last week against Italy was um, probably, it probably favored the Italians more with the French coming in the way they did a couple of guys back from injury they seemed a little bit disjointed italy um still riding on a high after november but this week they listen it was 32 19 and i thought maybe i it could it could have been like a 25 19 and france still would have been in it so, you know, it wasn't that, like, Ireland, like, when you watch the game, you see that Ireland really took control in the end and, and, and put the game to bed. But I think, if anything, France are secretly thankful for it. Uh, it sucks losing, and it could be the Six Nations, and it could be, uh, you know, it's definitely their first, no one's ever done a back-to-back -back Grand Slam. So, you know, there's that. But I think secretly, you know, it's great because the brains trust in, in, in the national side in France will all go away and say, right, so Ireland have shown how to beat us. How do we fix that? What do we do? How do we manage that? So that is the, that is the one thing that I feel. I don't think their personnel are not up to it. I don't think that they, uh, with their injuries and stuff, I think their players and everything, they obviously would prefer to have a, a full strength side. It, you know, everyone does, but the reality is you can't do it in a contact sport all the time. I think France will go away going awesome. You know, it sucks. We lost in Dublin and uh, we really were hoping to make a mark, but now we've just been had our feathers ruffled. We are playing the World Cup at home. We are really, really chomping to be world number one and be world champions. And we've been shown up how to get beaten. The Springboks nearly beat them. They, you know, they're getting a lot of answers to questions. Now they just need to rectify it. And I, I believe that they've got the people to do it. Whether they implement it or not, it's a different story. You know, the same old French connotations are there where you wonder, shit, are they going to just capitulate or whatever the story may be? But I believe that they can kick on from this. So the pressure of a home World Cup and all that sort of jazz aside, I think this is a great loss for them. It's come at the right time against the right team. Cooks, what do you think? Do you agree with what Sean said? Yeah. Um, it's, I don't think it's a bad loss. I think. You know, France, um, like you said, the, the form obviously, I mean, like, like, like Tomac has been playing well and you can sort of see he's come back into form and Fico has been, hasn't been the Fico of old and, you know, there's the, the Jolange and guys are coming through. They're not, El Trezo playing as well as he's used to. So I don't think it's a trade smash. I mean, I'd rather have the, the French problems in February than have them in, 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 in October. So I'd rather get these things out the way, sort these things out and, I, I genuinely don't, my, my feelings about France hasn't changed. Um, I, I do think it's the speed bump. I mean, you, you're coming in, the, they're also the best side in the world at the moment. The side is ranked number one and you, you saw that. So I, I feel like the way France played in the first half, I think they blot most other sides. I think they beat England in the first half, for example. They beat an all-black side. A potential could be the Springboks side the way they played. So I just, yeah, they just lost to a better side on the day, which is the number one. And I just don't, I don't think the French side have become shit overnight. And I think th them falling apart, like Sean said, that cap capitulation, ooh, English, see. Um, I don't think it's in them. I don't think it's in them anymore. I think it's, I think it's a different side. I think that they, they I've, I've seen really good side lose the sort of games before. So I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm still not worried, but for, you know, for them, for their sake, I'm worried about this. I'm still worried of playing against them, but for their sake, I think they don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. The weird thing is, Exactly like you guys said, when you look at the stats, I mean, the only thing that was really bad is obviously they scored one try and Ireland scored four. So that's obviously a big concern. But, and territory wasn't great. It was 64% for Ireland. But defenders beat in that more. Uh, clean breaks are almost level with Ireland. Uh, turnovers won, they were, almost, they were level with Ireland. Kicks from hand, they were level. It, and missed and the tackle percentage, Ireland was on 73% and France was on 90%. And I, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think Ireland almost did that by design. They almost did kind of like early Rassi Binob and the Springboks of 
will give you, will close you up on the outside and sort of force you back inside and force all those dangerous liners, the Penodes and the Duponts inside and back our chances to, to catch them. You know, it, they have close to 15 bodies trying to tackle them instead of just one or two at the outside. And it worked, I mean, mostly. I mean, Damien Peno still scored probably one of the most brilliant tries you'll see um, with Geelong having that awesome offload. But most times, even though there were some clean breaks and even though, you know, the fast attackers were able to beat just insane number of defenders the whole time, they still were able to keep a, I never saw able to keep a, a, a hole on France. And it seemed like, you know, the, the, the French did most of the things right. They just need to figure out just how to, you know, just ray up their attack and their kicking game mostly because it seems like all of the teams are a bit more wiser about that low kicking end that France has and have counters to it, whether it's ramming it up or, you know, kicking, you know, long back to them and just forcing them out of their rhythm. So, yeah, I guess it is good to have that opportunity to even fix your mistakes now. But, geez, looking at even some individual stats, Peno beat 11 defenders. Insane. Demortier beat nine and, and Dupont beat six. Um, let's speak on Dupont. Oh, go on, Sean. Demortier uh, impressed me. He he's yeah. uh, he's a slippery bugger. Um, uh, Peno was he's ridiculous. Left, he's left for you to go. I think he's almost exactly the same way that he runs. Even it, it's very similar to how David Peno runs. Yeah, Peno was ridiculous. Like the how he was beating some of those guys. I think you mentioned it. You're like he just doesn't know when he's tackled, but but Dumortier, um, I, I found very interesting. He he, I, as Thomas mentioned in our podcast that we never ever got to air. Um, he he, Penner's got these massive legs and it's just really hard to tackle him. And you can see why he gets through. He's just a big human. Dumortier is sliding out of these things somehow. Like he's very deceptive, and. Uh, he, for a youngster, his well, his finish, his his try was was relatively simple, but just the stuff he was doing, I was super impressed with him. Then all of a sudden, French have got like a billion freaking wings that they can pick. I mean, Villiers is not even back yet. Never mind uh, a great a favorite of the rugby bids show, which is Teddy Thomas as well. Um, oh, the best, <laughs> most balanced runner ever. <laughs> Sean. Okay, how does Dupont stop Mac Hansen and Max um, in that defensive moment? I don't know how you even explain that. Well, he's friends with Harry Potter. There's, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, how do you explain that shit? Like, I, the thing is, is us South Africans have seen it before with Edward van Amava, where you're just like, that's ridiculous. But uh, Dupont's gone and done it. That that guy is, uh, he's a he's a talent, man. I'm, I've been watching him very closely lately, um, and. Just him kicking off both feet is madness. He gets such distance. But the thing is, because he's kicking off both feet equally, he the defense can't set up. So they can set up one side, and then he's like, okay, cool, I'll kick with my other foot now just to really screw you over. So he always gets great distance because he's hardly ever under pressure. I was going to say, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I was Mac Hansen, I would have left Aviva Stadium and gone straight to the gym because there's no way scrum off his man handles me as I'm about to dive over and score for a try. And just like, I, 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 must, I would love to know what Mac Hansen was thinking because he picked that point and think, oh, cool, easy, easy foul points and just slowly but surely just gets dragged away from the trial and it just gets thrown out. But, um, but surely it's right. I mean, Dupont's, yeah, it's freakish what he's doing at the moment. And he's almost in that, um, that, bod, that, that, that peak bottom, bottom, bottom barrier stage. Like, he may not be like the world player of the year, the one, but like half the time he's probably the best player on the field, like talent wise. And he's just, that's where he's operating now, where he sort of, when he does something well, it's like, oh, DuPont's done this, or done this again. Or, like, I think that's where I sort of see him now in, in, in that old Bodden Barrett one. It's like, because the best player in the field, and, it, and you could give him the World Rugby Player of the Year award every year. But then it's like, it's just, you know, like, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, he's giving me very strong, I, I, I hate to say this, but he's giving me very strong, like, almost like getting into that, conversation of bread here of like Pete Johnny Wilkinson, Pete Dan Carter, Peak sort of like Richie Lacour, Brian O'Driscoll vibes of I don't care how bad or how good to use or France look, he looks like the best player on the field nine times out of ten. And that's a, a brilliant challenge. And I mean we've seen him now with the France team that's not having its way. And he's playing still to this 
amazing level and we've seen him grow his game. So yeah, he's just a brilliant rugby player. But let us move on to um, the, the next match, which was Scotland beating Thrashing Wales, actually, um, 35 points to seven. And obviously we have to start at one place. And Cooks, I mean, Ben Russell has now had, I think it's nine try assists in the last 10 tests that he's played. And I don't even, I mean, not to be the fun hater than I am, but I am a fun hater. I don't even think he's playing that like amazingly at the moment. I think there's still some like small mistakes that he can cut out of his game. I don't even think he's been playing as well as he did against Argentina last year. But I mean, he's cooking and Scotland is cooking. And, you know, you can say which one's the chicken and which one's the egg in that situation. But you can see how that is positively impacting the team. And that Scottish backline is looking dangerous at the moment. I'll say, um, I, I think he's put on tell. I mean, I mean, you know me, the, the fun lover. I'm, I've seen him cook in ways a lot like, like better. Like, I've seen him play a lot better, like individually in terms of just making mayhem happen. But I think the big difference this this year is, well, I mean, um, Chupalutu and Hugh Jones is all the knowns on Twitter, uh, Hugh Palutu. Um, those two, I think, have made a massive difference. To Fran Russell and Scotland because he's got a. I've always thought Fran Russell and Hugh Jones have always they've always had a great com- connection. They've always played well with each other, and then, then obviously Hugh Jones is just banished into thin air again, and then the like Gregor Town did Gregor Town things and didn't pick him. Um, so let me not get started on all Gregor. Um, but I think with Scotland, the big thing is the pack's playing really well, and I think that's 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 something that's that's helped them. But against England, they defended really well. And, and then Fran Russell obviously is able to pick apart all these moments. And I think the back line is as balanced as they have now. And that's missing Darcy Graham. Carl Stane's been amazing. I mean, I know Duan's been good, but Carl Stane for me is an, an underrated hero. Preach. But yeah, I think Scott Preach, preach, of, preach. I mean, Carl Stane. I'm sure he's been quality. Mate, I, I was trying to explain to people... Like I am a bit biased. Uh, I'm a big fan. I did a bit of work with uh, w- when he was at Griquas. I was doing a bit of work with Griquas, but he he's a, he is the hardest worker. He is con- his decisions he make makes he very seldom makes an error, but he works so hard. He's not your he's he'll go for the corner if he has to, but he will always make sure that the ball is available and alive if if he doesn't feel like he's going to make it. There's there's times where his his involvements have 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 been um have resulted in tries. He's he's incredible, and I'm so glad he got points this weekend. Sorry, Cooks. Yeah, no, hundred percent true, and me too. I think he's also that that winger is like you know the you know those wingers are just like they just don't make mistakes. They just do the right thing. Each, they get the ball ten times, ball either score try. They got no flaws in their game. Great great ball in hand, does defense, gets in the air. Love Carl Stan. I think with Scotland at the moment, it's. This was the big one, Tell. I mean, you, we spoke about it last year's but Beat England, lose to Wales. Beat England, lose to Ireland. Beat, and then they will underwhelm the next day. So I think for them, to, Wales may not be great, but for Ireland to sort of make that statement, I mean, I mean, for Scotland to make that statement, get that win now, they're two out of two. They're going to France with a whole lot of confidence, and I do think they can beat France because after coming off a, a performance like this. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, that's the worst, is it? I don't know, the timeline, sorry, I've lost, but the timeline now is, or Finn positive event. All these guys are going like Finn's might be the it might be the best ten in the world. Where were they when Finn was not playing well? It was just me. Where were those same people? <laughs> Where were they? It was being, when I was being attacked. Oh, you because look at your boy. Oh, your boy's getting smashed. Oh, your boy is this. Where were okay. now? I must I'd go find clips like no, but Finn's doing this. Oh, now all of a sudden they're like I, I just said them like you know what. I, just, I remember the dark, it was dark for me days of me on Twitter stage. Then <laughs> him and Gregor Towns are fighting. Where were they? Now look at them. Now, they, now they're basking in this glory. Where were they before 2011, 2021 Lions tour? And I said, Finn must play. They called me a madman. Where were, where were those guys? Oh. <laughs> but fine, let them enjoy Finn. Me and my seven Finn will carry on cooking. Dash, thanks for you. guys better hope Finn doesn't win the Six Nations. Their agendas, their agenda then. Oh, oh my oh, goodness. Dan Connor will come outside. Imagine, Dad Carter, imagine, oh my word. imagine the turmoil. Imagine, imagine the shitstorm in world rugby if Scotland grand slammed the Six Nations in a World Cup year. Imagine. I personally don't want to imagine to be. What I'm saying is, Dan Carter's never done in a rainy day in Cardiff. That's what I'm, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I, 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 I mean, in Feb, in Feb, no, 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 in the year tour. <laughs> I've look, we've been here before, guys, and last year we did this. I got caught up in the in the Scotland mania. I was like, okay, you know what, Scotland, they're looking really good. I think I even had a take that they might have one of the better four packs in the world. I was like, okay, this team looks solid, and then they laid an egg for the rest of the tournament. And I said to myself, I'm either just in Scotland again, but. I think I'm still, you know, to be the pessimist in this, I think this is more about how bad England and Wales are than how great Scotland is. And this next match against France will show a lot. Will show either Scotland is, you know, the best of the rest, you know, in that sort of second or whatever you want to call it, almost tier two outside of, you know, the top four France, Ireland, and South Africa, New Zealand. Or are they maybe someone that can join that conversation and, you know, start to cause Nidab and Rassi some problems because, you know, Scotland and Ireland are in our group later this year in the Rugby World Cup. I tell you, 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 you're being a pessimist, but I'm going to ask a question, but Cooks, I definitely want you to answer this. Um, I am going to chat, you know, when you say, is it the, are Scotland the best, um, like because they played against England and Wales who have been poor, blah, blah, blah. I do think, I don't think Scotland, I don't think any Six Nations side, and please, I, I will be corrected if I'm wrong because I, I'm not too familiar with many, many sides that have been going, have been, um, have been named. But I think Scotland have named the most attacking backline that the Six Nations has ever seen and one that is, is, is continuing. Like it's not, it wasn't a flash in the pan kind of thing. Like they're, this is how they're looking to play. I don't think there's been a, a more attacking side. Um, I, I don't a backline. I don't think it's the most balanced backline. I will say that. And my question, Cooks, is Huey Pilato are are brilliant. They're great. They're attacking. They are the best midfield pairing I've seen in a long time. Do you think they are sustainable defensively? Because I um I was a I was very hesitant to obviously when they unleashed when they unleashed themselves against the Stormers, they ripped it apart. But uh, um, I've always rated Hugh Jones. I think he's one of the best attacking players. He's got an attacking mind. I just worry on his defensive positioning. I don't have an issue with him, his tackle. He doesn't like shy away from tackles. I just think he gets in bad positions. And I did notice against the Stormers, he was not defending in the 13 channel. Whereas now I've seen for Scotland, he does defend in the 13 channel and around, but they, they do, they're very fluid in how they move the 10, 12, and 13 defensively, and it doesn't really matter too much. Do you think that they are sustainable long-term um, defensively? And if not, do you think that what they offer on attack outweighs what they could lose on defense? Oh, yeah, I'll I think Sean, that's a fantastic question. I think... And I, I think um, if it was England, for example, I thought, I thought last week they got it wrong in not playing Oli Lawrence at 12. And I thought, Bingo. I think if you play against Scotland, especially with Hugh Jones and Hugh Paludu, I think you'd need a more physical, a more physical centre pairing and sort of weigh them down and just keep sending numbers down there where I think that's, that's, a way, that's a way to sort of hurt them. I think obviously the Springboks, the interesting part is something like Damien Delaney, Lucanio Arm, I think. Look, I am also will be a, a, a tough nightmare for Hugh Jones' attack and defense because, I mean, I'm, he's a smoother, we a smart. But I have a feeling with Scotland is they are willing to go. If you look at, this, if, if you look at that England game, as much as in their possession, that, he feels like that side is built on turnover ball and they're willing to win the game 35-30, all five games. They, they're almost going, we're going to, we, we're going to win this game by running, running the score up. And I think the backline they have now, that's what it provides. I think they've tried, I mean, they've tried other options in, and I think with the, I mean, Hugh Pollute is probably the best option uh, at center. And I think it opens up the way because if you take away, like, I mean, Hugh Pollute, it's, it basically becomes a Fred and Russell and Stuart Hogg try and do something sort of game. And, you know, then Stuart Hogg does, tries to do too much and Finn tries to do too much. And I think now with the centers, they've got this balance where they got, they were they were acting huge ones and they got an extra playmaker. Now it's the ball going in the middle. He can create something, frees up someone like I thought Blake King was very good at fifteen again on the, on the weekend. And someone like that comes with the bench as well. So I think it's it's gonna be the way they go. It's gonna be interesting what happens when Darcy Graham gets back. 
because it's going to be hard to not play him as well as Carl Scott's been playing. And one thing about Duan, I must add, someone like Duan is also, it's such a cheat code for someone like Finn because Finn is a very good and like few jaws at throwing the ball over the top. And now Duan's with this bit of mongrel about it. So I think also added a different dimension in the way that he's been playing at the moment. So I think what Cricket Town has done well is build this throughout the four years. It wasn't consistent, but now that Scotland has a strong and a very good defense, they have at worst a decent set piece. You know, their scrum is quite good. Pierre Skuman is playing his socks off. Richie Gray's made a big difference to their scrum and their lineouts and just getting um, making that solid again. They've got obviously really good loose forwards. They still can call on Hamish Watson and Rory Dodge to, to join that. And that's them being solid in those areas, then having a very good defense, then build the foundation for them to have that attacking game plan going. Glad that Ray Kingold is finally playing his fullback and not fly half. I think he should definitely replace Stuart Hogg, if I'm honest. Um, I, I would, yeah, it's, it's, we're going to see how Hugh Jones does in France. I mean, it's difficult to drop him now. Um, I was thinking they probably played Chris Harris in the France and Ireland games, but. It's now up to Hugh to show that he isn't overawed by, you know, playing, you know, the best outside centers in the world in the next few weeks. So if Jones and Jeff Pinotti can show, um, you know, so, uh, they're solid in defense, um, you know, I think Darcy Graham will be eligible for the next few rounds. Then, yeah, there's a uh, decent chance Scotland can at least give um, France and Ireland again. I, I think the main thing for Scotland, especially in the group that they're in for the World Cup, is. Beyond winning, they just need to show that they can compete against France and Ireland because the Springboks are, depending on how you want to see it, they're either at that level or just below that level. So, and they probably need to both beat at least one of them, if not both of them, if they want to qualify for the quarterfinals. So these next two games for Scotland are going to be massive to see if this is you know, a real thing, if they're a real threat, or if they're just going to be the best of the rest. Yeah, I... I just want to, on the Hugh Jones comment you made, I think Hugh Jones is very comfortable in his own game. I think, well, he very much knows what he's good at and what he's not good at. I don't feel that he's going to be overawed by anyone or feel like, oh shit, I'm not going to be able to deal with a, a ring rose or whatever. He's going to go and do what he does. Um, that is the one one good thing about him at, at the moment. I he, he, you know what I mean? Like he's not he's not going to look like a deer in the headlights. Like he he may get stuff wrong, but he's he's mature enough as a player where and he's got a great connection um, with uh, with his twelve and with his outside backs that he'll just brush it off um, and then just kind of set up for the next phase. So it's more about how will the other sides exploit anything that they they can pick up there. On, I'm going to save, I'm going to, I've got the last two. They're both, it's both South African talk, which I love, Safas abroad. But on the pack, on what is going on with the forwards, you mustn't forget that Peter de Villiers is the forwards coach for Scotland. He has been since 2019 and he has done a remarkable job. I think what you're saying is correct. The way that the pack are handling themselves, how they've kicked in at the moment has provided the foundation that the backs have needed. They've always been expansive. They've always looked to be expansive. They just haven't had the firepower and the personnel up front. And I, I think Pity's done really well with how he's he's managed that um, sorted out and brought them brought them together. They they really are a force. The other one is Duan Fanamava. All I want to say is I am so glad that this Duan Fanamava didn't arrive on the scene for the British and Irish Lions when they were in South Africa. He would have been too much for us at the time. He, he has been incredible. He, he was attacking well last year. Yes, he beat a countless defenders last season in the Six Nations. Um, he had a reasonably good Lions tour, but... This Duan Fanamava in 2023 is streets ahead of any other Duan Fanamava that 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 we have seen. He is the way he sees things, he sums them up and how he executes different parts of his game. He's he's got different things. He's not 
a massive steamroller. He's a massive unit. He's now got feet. He's got a fend. He, he, He's got different parts to his game where he's looking for other options. He's very, very, very different. And that's the thing that is happening that we are seeing now. We have seen how he has evolved as a player. We were all, and I, I, I said it every time, if Duan van der Merwe starts, starts against the Springboks for the British and Irish Lions for three tests, I'll be happy. I have no problem with it. And he did, if I'm not mistaken, but he played a majority of it. I, this Duan van der Merwe would cause havoc he's really in incredible form he's grown his game he's he's kept his speed his pace and his aggression and he's added to it plus add to that the connection he's got with his midfield and his and his um and his fullback he's also him and Carl Stein were are constantly looking for work Carl Stein is everywhere that man is non-stop work he's grafting all the time but Tyler you're 100% correct Black King owns a 15. I, I, I tweeted it on Saturday. The man, the way he was running, I, I've watched him a fair bit when he's played at 10 and that whole conversation was happening. And he didn't look like that. He didn't look that comfortable. He wasn't running those lines. He wasn't running with that, uh, that heads up uh, approach. He's a 15. And uh, I, I'm quite a big fan of Hoggy. I think that there's some big things that are going to happen. You can't replace Finn. Whenever they moved King on to 10, there was a problem with Finn or Finn was injured or whatnot. So you could kind of, you could kind of justify it that way. Now, when you're going to have Finn Russell, Hogg and Kinghorn all fit at the same time, someone's going to bench. And I'm pretty sure that maybe Hoggy will get one or two more starts. But if Kinghorn carries on playing like this, is he's probably going to have to sit bench. And will he, will he, will he, will he, will he move to the bench? I, I think he will. I don't think they'll, um, it's going to be a toss up between him and, and Harris, which is going to be a tough one. So there's some decisions to be made. Yeah, I think you've, you've summed it up quite well, Sean. I think with the King Horn thing, at least luckily you also had your reserve 10. So you actually don't even need to really make any big changes to the 23. So you can still have Hogg and um, Harris as your true, background true. reserves. And yeah, even Hulk can play 10 if, if, if needs be as well. The Dwan thing is really interesting. I Maybe I'm, I'm just too much of a Dwan fan. I've literally been a fan of Dwan van der Merwe since um, 29, uh, 2019, since um, his high school days, so <laughs> early 2010s. Um, and he was always like this for me. So he was always this dangerous runner. He was always this really badass runner. He was always this like chaos breaker. Like, uh, I don't know if that even was the right term. The only things that he needed to just work out were just almost technique things, you know, things under the hard ball, his positioning in defense, all that sort of stuff. And I still have my questions about that. He wasn't really tested on those things in the last few games. Although, to me, one thing you can notice is that Max Maynard's in the England game, he scored the two tries on Duan's side, but I don't think that was his fault. Oh, those were in, in like his fault at all. But this year, I think Scott was just using him better. And I think they can still use him more. I think they can still, you know, play him. I think they can still use him like all first phase as a, as a decoy option or use him just to track the ball up a little bit. You know, there's ways, if you have a player like that, you must use him as much as possible. And we saw, and we can, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk about it, but that try that he scored in the first test against England is probably right up there with one of the best individual tries that I've seen at least in the last few years. And that's, that's also try, just... That's a try of the season, so no, It's done. Yeah, it's, a <laughs> the, it's a try of the tournament, but the try of the season is pretty much done, done, you know? Yeah. So if he's able to do all of those sort of things, I would try to use it as much as possible. But that's a nice thing, and that's what Coach was saying earlier, that Finn Russell, this is what's bringing the best out of them, and that's what we've seen at least with Racing as well. You give them all these options to play off. You give them a, a secondary and even a tertiary playmaker and Jones and Hogg. Even Tree Pelotu is, is a good playmaker himself. I mean, yeah, even Carstairs is not too bad with the ball. And then you can just, you know, you can get those running threats all around him as well. I think that's when Finn is able to make the right decisions and to play people in and also not to try and do all the hero board sometimes. You know, you talk about Carl Stein and being a playmaker. I think he's a better 13 than he is a winger. 
Huh. So, like, th- there's that, and and um, now that I'm I'm thinking about it, that's possibly that could also possibly help the the uh, Hugh Jones and that midfield setup now defensively. You know, he could be he could be the guy that is gluing that together. I know you don't ever expect it from um, from a winger, but that could be the you know what I mean. The balance could be settled there. But Tupelotto, he's incredible. He's a he's a basher. He's a runner. He's a kicker and a distributor. Like, and and yeah. he's he's getting he's there. So he he really is. I I do, and I, it's not it's no means uh, out of, out of uh, just being horrible or anything. But I really want to see Scotland under pressure on in the back line. Like, yeah. I want to see I want to see the defense push up hard on them, and I also want to see um, them have to defend hard. That's that's the that's what everyone's waiting for. Everyone's waiting for that test match where 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 someone is running at Scotland and they have to they have to front up hard and they do it against um, against England. The the tackles that that the midfield got through was huge, 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 huge. And I think no one was really paying that much attention because it's Calcutta Cup, blah blah blah, and it was all about England. Um, but moving forward. When Scotland put in a massive defensive effort, I think that's when everyone is going to go, okie dokie, there's, there's trouble. Because if you look at every every side that is in in line to possibly win the World Cup, they are defensive giants and everything else afterwards. Look at Ireland, look at, um, at New Zealand, look at South Africa, look at France. The, those guys, they're all in contention for a World Cup. They've all got mammoth defenses. So that's all Scotland. We that's all everyone wants to see is just have them de, uh, um, um, defend, uh, have to defend and test it in the defensive setup. Um, just quickly on their pack. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about the backline that's been good, but the pack's obviously been giving that. Um, they've been solid uh, up front, and just soon maybe um, call out or shout out a few a few names. Uh, I think Luke Crosby's played really well at seven, and you know he's, my, really well. he's yeah. my pick for young player of the tournament. Oh, okay. Go on. No, no, no. Sorry, I just want to, you were you were talking about. I just oh. wanted to mention that he's he's <laughs> yes. he's my one to keep an eye on for young player. Yeah, well, he's twenty six. I, I guess you mean more breakout player than young. So that's that's what I, was, I knew. I knew I got it wrong. But yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the and, breakout player. Yeah, and and when other fans have been calling, have uh, been like saying uh, good things about Matt Ferguson as well, and I think he's just a really good workman like eight. I think there's, you know, a lot, and I hope this isn't taken in the wrong way, but I think there's a lot of Warren Whiteley in him in terms of just high work rate, gets around the field, maybe doesn't have the ball skills that Warren had, but you know, he's topped the attacking charts again this weekend. He had 26 last week, 19 this week. He gets around the the the, the field. There's so much um, in the game, and he's just a really good player to have in your loose trio, so that you know the likes of Richie and Hamish, when Hamish comes back, can do their thing as well. And then I've mentioned Richie Gray, but I think another one is um, Pierre Schumann or Pierre Schumann. Um He's been really Schum. good as well. So. <laughs> That's actually really cool. I'm, I'm glad that they've adapted that as well. But then let's maybe move on to Wales. And maybe we can also bring in England as we talk about this in England's victory 31-14 over Italy. I think it's maybe the best way to discuss Wales and, and is to discuss it with England because they're in, obviously in similar places, just find their coaches, uh, results weren't really going their way, maybe some bigger problems in their unions. Obviously, Wales have much bigger problems. And so far, not so good for Gatland and probably better for Borthwick. He'd probably want to be in Borthwick's camp rather than Gatland's camp at the moment. I always thought it would be easier. Well, if, if this conversation was had beforehand, it would be, I uh, would always have thought England would have been easier to to do things with because I thought England were up very much on track for the World Cup. Um, probably wrong there in terms of um, in terms of being completely on track, but they're just a couple of personnel changes away from getting it sorted. Wales are in a bit of trouble, but I think that they could 
not easily, but I think they could be ready on time. And it's unfortunately going to have to be a nothing as no crazy game plans or anything like that. It's going to be just a, a simple stuff and they're going to have to work on just the bread and butter of rugby and hope that they get by elsewhere. The Welsh love a, love a 13, 12 full-time score, you know? So that if they stay in the game, then bigger will kick. And, uh, and if not him, it's half penny. And if not him, you know, it's Anscom or whoever else is, is playing. You know, they're happy to do that. I'd like to see Nick Tompkins get a little bit of um, a go. Um, I think, yeah, I just, I don't think well, Wales are not playing well and they're getting done. Um, but there's going to be a little bit of a, of a shake up somewhere along the line or Gatlin's going to dig his heels in and take the boys away to Iceland for two weeks and like send them around in a speedo and get them to learn to, to know each other and love each other a little bit more and, and then go to go to the World Cup as the tightest team ever. Um, so it, it's, yeah, I, I think Wales is a little bit more work, but I think they, they, they could do it. England are very interesting for me. I, against Scotland, they, it was very evident that they need a big player at 12 or 13. And um, you've got to decide who you want at 10. And then you've got to have, if you've got Marcus Smith and you want to have Farrell at 12, then you've got to have Ollie Lawrence at 13 or Manu at 13. Um, if you've got Marcus Smith at 10 or Owen Farrell at 10, then you can have Ollie at 12 or Manu at 12. Um, and uh, I mean, you could even run Stewart at 12 on attack or first phase ball or something, but they need that platform. Against Scotland, it, if you watch that game, Owen Farrell and England literally have to pry open the door in order to make space. He has to manufacture, he has to manipulate every little bit of something somewhere to gain a bit of advantage and do something. Now with Ollie Lawrence there, that he's he's smashing over the gain line. Once you've got once you've got gain line advantage, your your game plan, the way you approach the passes, what you do, how you address it, where the gaps are, change. You don't have to, nothing's forced. Nothing is structure, structure, structure. You actually like, cool, now we get to wrap around. Now when I'm running, I'm running front foot ball. I have two options. I can play them. So whether it's Farrell at 10 or Smith at 10, they've got to have a big runner at 12 or 13, however they do it. And uh, it, it's you can still do a, a Smith, Farrell, 10, 12, but you can't have a Slade or a Marchant at, at 13, sadly, which burns me because I um, – I'm a massive fan of, of, of Joe Marchant. I think he's going to, I wish he played more rugby for England at 13, even at the Blues when Rico Ioani was starting above him, pissed me off immensely. But having said that, um, Slade had a great game this weekend. But England are, a, are an easy fix. They, they, they messed up their loose trio balance and they got it right this week and it proved like one of the best decisions ever. Dawn Brunt still, still in, in your words, Tyler, on fraud watch for me. He, he had a better game this weekend. That's because um, of, of Ludlam and, and Willis. They were immense. And a massive shout out to Ludlam, who has been um, huge the last two weeks. Huge, huge, huge. So um, he's been between, like, he's for me been, been England's player of the championship after two rounds. Um, been great on the side of the scrum. So yeah, they needed to fix the Lucy's and they needed to fix what was happening at 10, 12 and 13 and how they balanced that out. They've done it. And England may not have played the best rugby this weekend, but they played effective rugby and people having a go at Owen Farrell. Owen Farrell doesn't play like that for Saracens. You know, he doesn't kick like that. That's not his game. Um, you know, that's not where that's not. And, but he's probably one of the most professional players in that he is, he is whatever the team needs, he'll do. Even if it's like, you'll see how the way he plays and how he manages things and what he does. But England just, Italy were nowhere, nowhere this weekend. They were just kicked to death and England went and scored and won the game. And it's inverted commas, boring rugby and not great, but as a bonus point win, and they will use that as a trajectory to move forward. Yeah, I think just to start with Wales. So... I think Wales are just going back to basics and, you know, use what's, um, whatever advantages that they have. 
So play as much as possible with their keep chase game. Try and you know get um, themselves going with 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 that. The, the 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 main thing for Wales now is just working. What what can they do that they can work on for you know the next few tests in the Six Nations and obviously going on to the World Cup. So I would say just play the big guys and, and try to do the kick chase game. Try to be as you know physically uncompromising as possible and as strong in defence as possible. That's all you can do. And it it does take a bit more of a mixture of the old and the new. It's not about testing all the old people, but it's about just being selective and just being like, okay, we'd rather give Jack Morgan and Daffy Jenkins, Chris Schunzer, um, game time rather than, you know, Hannah Jones and Justin Tipperick and all that sort of stuff. So we'll have to see how how Wales goes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Rugby Bits podcast. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, um, the episode got cut and we are a bit, a bit chopped and screwed like the Welsh defence in, in a few places. But this is just sort of the epilogue at the end to just try and tie everything up. We are, yeah, we have been very um, privileged by two great weeks of Six Nations action and also just looking at the, the, the six teams and then looking at their form. We, there's clearly a leader in the pack. Ireland is clearly the best team in the world right now. They seem to be improving each and every game. They seem to have, you know, a game plan for all seasons, for all teams and are growing in confidence in how to and how they, they, they will they win games and how they beat opposition. Be it their kicking game, be it their forwards, be it their back line, they seem to have all the tools in the shed for them to have a Grand Slam run and have a, a good run in the World Cup later this year. We have France, they're still in Tier 1. The boys here think that there's still nothing ready to worry about and this is a loss at the right time for the French. And it's about how they pick themselves up in the next two weeks in the Scotland and the England games. If, if, they, if those turn into defeats, then we can start maybe pressing the panic button. But if they, as we expect them to do, win and show they, they, the gulf in quality between themselves and Scotland and England, then it should be all fine. And it's now just about what adjustments they make uh, when they face the best of the best later this year. We have Scotland, who are uh, the new emerging team in that second group of, of countries. And they're showing that they've they, they, they've put together all the things that they've been working on for the past few years. You know, the, the, the great defense, the, the good set piece, um, the, the educated kicking game into a coherent game plan where they can just let their counterattack loose at, at any turnover ball. Can they do this against France? Can they do this against Ireland? Can they even do the unthinkable and win a Six Nation? We will see that in the next few weeks. But this is as good as we've seen Scotland. They did um, show up when we asked them to show up in the Wales game. They did follow up the now annual defeat of England with a good performance against Wales. So now it's about, okay, we know Scotland not good and are more than deserving of that fifth place ranking in the World Rugby Rankings. The next question is how close are they or or are they even better than the, the top sides in the world in France and Ireland and they get to prove that as study France in two weeks time against France. Wales and England are on two pretty similar places. England though are, are the glass half full approach. They seem to have made um, some definitive decisions on who they're backing in key positions. They are backing a certain 10-12, well, Farrell's, um, Lawrence and Slade in 10-12-13. They're backing um, Lewis Ludlam in the loose forwards. They seem to have the structure of the team that they want. They're clearly going to start by working on the set piece and the defense and those things and then building from there. Don't expect any attacking razzmatazz from England. Unfortunately for Marcus Smith fans, it, it seems like he'll be used more as an impact player. And I think that's maybe even a good thing for Marcus Smith rather than um, rather than starting and having the Farrell Smith combination. We can see that it can work in certain circumstances. So why not have it as a trump card in the last 20 minutes to reinvigorate the game and to be able to chase down whatever needs that need to be chased down. But... Owen Farrell still a class play, he's still one of the best operators at 10 in the world. And he still is someone that 
yeah, he's trying to really just drive and direct a team that still is trying to search for that direction after the change in management. And it'll be interesting to see how they incorporate um, the likes of Courtney Laws and uh, Tom Curry and Harry Arundel in the next few weeks. Do they come straight into the teams? Um, what does this mean for some of the players that showed a bit of form, like Tom Willis and Lewis Ludlam and um, Ollie Hassel Collins? And how will the team look by at the end when we when they face Ireland? We'll hopefully then have a, an idea as to whether this England team is making quick progress or it will be a slow and steady progress. It's also looking good for Italy. Um, they did um, have that really good game against France. They were a bit disappointing in the first 60 minutes against England, but came back really well and were threatening to even try and steal the game from England in the second half. The attack is amazing. The game management is not so good. They probably shouldn't have started with Riccioni in the in the in the test against England. They should have still stayed with Ferrari at the at the at the tight head. And now it's just about the quality and depth that if they can build that. I think their first fifteen can stick with most other first fifteens around the world and keep things close. It's now a matter of, you know, once they get um, Paolo Garbisi back and he plays ten. They, they could be even 5 to 10 points better already. So now that they can fare, well, they're facing Ireland next week and that'll be tough, but the, the Wales game and the Scotland game, if maybe Scotland does take a bit of a confidence that after the Ireland and the France games, there's no reason why they can't aim for at least one victory out of the next three matches. It'll be interesting to see how Garbisi just adds something extra to this team. Finally, Wales. What can we say about Wales? It's not looking good on and off the field for Wales. The Warren Gatland era has not has got off to a false start, so to speak. And it's a it's a it's a difference of two eras. It seems like there's a a good crop of young players that are coming through, but are obviously green and inexperienced. And there's a crop of old players that have served Gatland well that are becoming beyond their prime. How do you put those two together? That's the question that Warren Gatland has. And where's that missing middle of players that should be hitting their peak right now and, and in their late 20s and are challenging to be the best players in the world in their certain positions. And what are Wales good at? I would say that Wales should focus on their kicking game, their and their aerial battle and, and just trying to be defensively solid. So just go back to the Warren Ball um, uh, template because the best performances for Wales in this World Cup cycle happened when they've done, they kept it tight you can see in that match against the Springboks when they won in Bloemfontein. You can see in some of their games um, in the 2021 Six Nations, which they won. When they went back to the classical Warren Ball, they, they seemed to perform better. That seemed to be their unique signing point. So go back to that. Pick the big boys in the back line. Pick the, the, the NBA centers there and have the likes of Cuthbert and Adams and North. And Williams just chasing up and hunters from Dan Bigar for the whole night. That's probably the best way you can at least keep the, clo- the score close at the moment. Because the side-to-side play that Gatlin is trying to do is is commendable. And um, Joe Hawkins is, is showing some good things as a second distributor. But it's not working at the moment. And then we also have to look forward to some URC action this weekend. As the Six Nations takes its week off. We have two big local derbies in the South African context. We have the Lions face the Sharks in, in Johannesburg. And for the Lions, it's just about showing that they can beat the Sharks when the Springboks rested. We aren't expecting pretty much any of the Springbok regulars to be playing in this weekend's game. So these are good opportunities for especially the Lions and the Bulls at home to get those big points um, in, in, in those matches. The Lions still have very faint hopes of making the top eight. They'll obviously need a run. That's probably over. And this is a very important match for the Sharks to win because they're still at the edge of the top eight battle. They would la- they need to pick up points as, as, ma- as many points as possible because they don't want to be relying on other teams and other factors to, um, number one, qualify for the top eight, but also, mo- and maybe more importantly, to qualify in the Champions Cup. Um, the European Champions Cup next year they need to be probably in the top 7 because they'll probably not be a Welsh side in that top 8 so the Sharks need to win even with their second team the Sharks should back themselves to win with their second team against the Lions but there's an opportune moment for the Lions who won't really lose any players um, from the enforced race for the Springboks there's a good opportunity for the Lions to get one over the Sharks 
and the Bulls um, have their match against the Stormers. The Bulls are still looking for revenge from their defeat in the URC final last year. And there's a good opportunity to face the Stormers without their regular spring marks and the magic men that they have. Good opportunity to also see if the, the double project is working even without the, the key players. Which we saw two weeks ago against the Sharks that it was humming along nicely. Jake White is now back from um, his stay in the hospital. He's fit and healthy and I'm sure he's frothing at the opportunity to, to get one over the, the Stormers. And this match will be a good... Um, this match is, has big um, implications for the URC table as well. The Bulls are still within shouting distance of the Stormers in, for that second place in the log. They win this, they can get hopefully four or five points closer. They can maybe make a run at a try to sneak ahead of the Stormers in the top two. If the Stormers win, they probably um, effectively secure the, the South African Conference um, uh, Championship, which means they'll probably be at least in the top three um, in the in the ERC playoffs. But for the Bulls, it's to try and get to the top two to also just maintain um, some security in that top four so that they can host a home quarterfinal in the URC. So there are big implications for the matches this week. And we are looking forward to the Six Nations. That'll happen only in two weeks' time. We'll preview that. We'll hopefully get another um, uh, reg uh, review of one of the countries in the Six Nations and talk about how they're going and how they're looking for the World Cup. But this is a great time for rugby. There's, we probably had the best 40 minutes of Test Rugby in a long time in that France Island game. We have a informed Scotland that's looking really good. I mean, everyone now is a big fan of Russell Stad. We have an England team that's starting to put some things together. We have Italy that looks at least a lot more competitive than they've looked in the past. We need Wales to come to the party and then we'll have some good um, domestic action in, in, in the uh, or franchise action in the URC, the top 14 in the Premiership this weekend. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Ravens podcast. We again apologize for... Uh, it being a bit disjointed in certain places we just had to put things together at the end we're just glad to put something out please visit us on on on, on our on our social media pages and um on the on the podcast pages and, and 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 please share this podcast with everyone that you know loves rugby okay bye-bye <laughs>